windows are shut and the alarm is on and this thing that is coming in and damaging my children does not know the code with which to disarm that alarm, but it comes in and it leaves as quietly and as effortlessly as it came. And I resent it. I don't feel guilty about it for I did not plant the idea in my daughter's brain, but I resent that we are raising her in a society where that is acceptable. And so long as that is something that damages the mind of my white children, make no mistake what it does to the minds of black and brown children. For when black and brown children see those images of divinity that look nothing like themselves, when they see those images of the first human beings in these Bible story picture children's books that are absurd renderings of the first humans who we know from all biological, genetic, and anthropological evidence would have been dark-skinned Africans, there is not even a debate about that anymore. When we allow children to see those images it doesn't only instill a false sense of supremacy amongst my children, it can, if we are not careful, instill a sense of internalized depression and internalized inferiority in the mind of black and brown children. And as long as our minds are colonized, we cannot possibly be free because once the mind is colonized, it is the most important territory in this system of white supremacy. And so I have a very personal and deep reason to want this to change. It is not charity for which I do this. It is not to help or to save others. Please make no mistake about this. The reason that I and the reason that other white folks historically not enough, but more than we were taught about in school, have stood as allies in solidarity with people of color is because of what it does to us, the damage that it does to us, the damage that it does to our families and our communities, even as it gives us immense advantage and privilege and opportunity. The cost of this continued system is too high, and not only for the targets who are people of color, but for the collateral damage who is everybody else. Thank you all so much for being here. we will accept two questions, one at each mic. Thank you all so much. Okay, so we'll, we'll do a couple of these. I, I went longer than I was supposed to. That's, that's on me. Sorry about that. We'll start down here. Yeah. How you doing, sir? My name is uh, Ron Mack, the hip optimist, and you mentioned those, uh, those folks who taught you more about black and brown truth yeah. than the uh, academics. Yeah. Um, and, and conversations and information like that has been in the black community. So my question is, do you think that you can communicate the truth you speak to the dominant group you spoke about easier than black men and women with the same truth? Um, well, I mean, the obvious answer to that at least at this point in our history, is yes. And it's not because um, I know it better or say it better, but it is because when people have internalized a sense of supremacy, they will often disregard truth when it comes from those who they've been led to believe do not have the capacity to tell them truth. So if white folks have internalized racism, and we have, we will hear anti-racism from other white folks quicker. If men have internalized sexism, and we have, we will hear it anti-sexist messages from men more readily. The, the real goal is when folks of color can stand up here in front of white folks and say the very same thing and be taken every bit as seriously. In the meantime, in the meantime, those of us who were white have to follow the advice which the black leadership of SNCC gave to us in 1967. See, so the history tells us that Whites were expelled from SNCC in 67. It makes it sound that it was this very personal kicking out, like a very mean thing. But when you talk to the folks who were involved, as painful as that decision was, it was painful for everybody. And I've talked to black folks who were involved in the so-called expulsion. I've talked to the white folks who were so-called expelled. But there was an understanding, as regrettable as it was that things came to that point, there was an understanding on the part of the white folks as to why it was happening and what we had to do and what SNCC was telling 
the white folks in the organization was, you got to go work with your people because they will not listen to us. So if you can do that and open that door for people in the white community, fine. And so, you know, 90% of the talks that I give are specifically with those folks who have learned to disregard that truth from people of color. So it's a regrettable truth that the answer to your question is yes, but so far as I can tell right now, that, that is the answer. But I still think as a matter of accountability, I always wanna point out that the truth that I know, other than my own personal story, which I know, came from folks of color. So if white folks hear it and go, oh, that was really brilliant. Oh, that was great. Oh, I never heard that before. Well, you heard it a million times before. You just had the luxury of ignoring it. So let's stop ignoring it. And then we can hear truth from everywhere that it comes. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Larissa and I'm a student here at Philander. And I was just wondering how can we as individuals help this change and wake up from denial, how can we make this change to diminish the margin between racial suppression, the uneven privilege? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, you make change by, by telling truth and doing it uncompromisingly. And the problem is right now we're in this period where I think a lot of people have invested hope in candidates and in leaders. And I mean no disrespect, certainly to the president when I say that he is not capable of bringing the change that we're talking about here in terms of ending white supremacy. No president is, no president. And, and, and I think that the, the danger that I see is that people in, 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 in the moment of hopefulness and enthusiasm about his campaign forgot the history of the country for a minute. And the history of the, not just our country, any country, the history of any country is that real change, I mean real transformative change to end systems of oppression has never come from the top down ever. It has always come from the bottom up. So while we cannot expect, while we cannot expect less of this president just because he's a man of color and we cannot hold him to any less of a standard, we ought not hold him to a higher standard either. We have to do the work. If, if we would have had to do the work with Bill Clinton, if we had to do the work with, with, with any other president, then we have to do the work now. We have to leave this president, just like any other president, with absolutely no political wriggle room whatsoever, no choice but to do what is right and what is just. And if we fail in that, that will be on us. That will not be on him. That will be our failure. That will be our weakness. And so we have to tell the truth, especially when he cannot. We have to speak the truth, especially when he cannot, because this is a man who, if he even simply says that the police in Cambridge, Massachusetts acted stupidly in arresting Henry Louis Gates, which they did, which they did because, because Henry Louis Gates did not break the law. This is what most of white America doesn't understand, but the law in Massachusetts says disorderly conduct is not yelling at a cop. That's not illegal. So when he said they acted stupidly, well, that's the word, because if you're a cop and you arrest a man for a crime he didn't commit, I don't know what else to call it. It's stupid, right? So, but he says that, and then immediately what happens? Glenn Beck says, well, see, he hates, he hates white people. Because he criticized one white dude. He hates white people. And Rush Limbaugh says, this is a black president trying to destroy a white cop. No, this is a president calling out behavior that's not legal. Right? And not illegal on the part of Henry Louis Gates, but illegal on the part of the Cambridge police. So we have to tell the truth, because if he can't without getting slapped down, if he can't bring that up without getting slapped down, that means we have to fill in those gaps. Otherwise, people, and not just white folks, but folks of color too, will fall into that trap of thinking that everything is good. You know, it was Will Smith who said back like around the time of the election, I guess it's easy to say this when you make 15 mil of film, but Will Smith made the comment on Oprah Winfrey's show that what he liked about Obama was now all our excuses are gone. Profoundly disrespectful because it's like saying, well, racism is just an excuse that my people, meaning black folks coming from him, that we use. It's not an excuse. It's a reason why people face obstacles. It's a reason why things go down the way they do. But even he fell prey to that. And a lot of folks, you know, were excited and I understand that. And people said, well, now I can tell my children they could be anything and actually mean it. And that's deep. That's profound. And for those of us who've never had to think about that with our kids, we, we need to really think about what that means. At the same time, let's not get carried away. Because the reality is, if the only way you get to be president is you bring it like Barack, and you have a style and an affect and a level of erudition that he has, which like nobody has, white, black, or otherwise, right? That's just not common for anybody. Then what ends up happening is we end up creating an archetype of acceptable blackness, 
right? A very narrow archetype of ideal. As long as you're like him, it's fine. But if you wear your hair in locks, no, no. If you didn't go to Harvard, if you only went to Philander Smith, oh no, oh no, right? So we have to guard against that. Those of us who are white, those who are of color, we have to keep demanding that excellence and merit and ability be seen in a multiplicity of ways. Because for those of us who are white, we've never had an archetype of acceptability. Like you can be really articulate if you're white or you can be like the opposite of that and still become president of the United (laughs) States. The difference, so we have to, we have to constantly remind ourselves and the places where we work and the places where we go to school and our family and our communities about not getting so caught up in the hype of a president of color, as important and symbolically meaningful as that is, that we forget the systemic truth, the systemic piece. And I think if we keep telling that truth over and over, start right where we are, I think the fact that this institution has this built-in commitment to social justice is a model for schools around the country. I wish it is one that other schools would adopt and copy, but until they do, until they do, you keep doing what you're doing here, and you serve as... Uh, as as uh, 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 many of us used to say back during the anti-apartheid struggle vis-a-vis South Africa, and as we used to talk about with regard to the struggle against U.S. intervention in Nicaragua and El Salvador in the 80s, serve as the threat of a good example, right? The threat of a good example. When you demonstrate a model that is replicable, that not only provides top-notch education, but also prepares people to change the world in which they find themselves, that becomes a model. That becomes something that allows other people and draws other people to you. So I think you keep doing what you're doing, uncompromising. Do not use nice words and pretty words to try to cover up what is criminal behavior, because that's what the system is, is criminal behavior. Thank you. Thank you. Can we do a couple more real quick? Okay. Okay, yeah. yeah. Good evening. I would like to know what impact does the fact that the U.S. does not acknowledge and denies the institution of slavery against blacks, the genocide against the Good Aboriginal question. people, have on the U.S.? And why have places like South Africa and other places initiated reconciliation and we haven't? Well, I think the reason that, well, the impact that not acknowledging the horror of the Ma'afa or genocide of indigenous people has on us as a nation is that it allows us to remain in this state of of perpetual denial and childishness. I mean, this, this, this inability to say the fundamental truth that Reverend Wright spoke from which President Obama had to distance himself and what he said was far more accurate version of American history than that which any of us learned in high school. And yet you can't say it, not because it isn't true, but because you're not allowed to say it, because to say it means you hate America. This is interesting. They even have a word for it, anti-Americanism. Now think about the uniqueness of that. Like if you crit- criticize the history of France, what is the word for that? anti francism No, that word doesn't even exist. Other countries are not so egotistical that they even come up with a phrase to describe when you don't like them. But we have a phrase because we're so damn special. You know, and so people so people act like we're the greatest nation ever struck off from the forehead of God. Right. And 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 then when you bring up the stuff that you mentioned, what do people say? They say, well, that was a long time. That's a long time ago. We need to let that go. OK, I have a little thought experiment. Actually, I want you to try this. Actually, I don't recommend you try this because I don't want you to become the victim of physical violence. So just think about it. <laughs> July 4th. Think about this. Go out to a July 4th parade. I want you to go up to somebody who's got a big American flag pin on. The Boy Scouts are marching by. They got flags and trumpets and beating on drums and everybody's, and they're getting ready to shoot off fireworks. And I want you to go up to somebody that's like crying through their patriotic tears. (laughs) And I want you to lean over to them right at the best moment of the parade and say, "Um, so tell me, when are you gonna get over all this? I mean." This whole, this whole breaking away from the British thing, that was a long time ago. And it just seems to me that you ought to move on. You see, you will get no, you'll get knocked upside the head. Somebody would think you were crazy. We love to remember the past when it makes us look good. We don't want to deal with it when it doesn't. The reason we won't acknowledge it is the crime is ongoing. If the crime is not ongoing, nations will acknowledge, 
right? So South Africa could acknowledge because apartheid fell and they began immediately to rebuild the country on a different basis, right? Even the Germans have gone far, far much further down the road in acknowledging their crimes during the regime of Adolf Hitler than we have ever gone. In Germany, they actually teach children about the, 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 the show of the Holocaust, the extermination not only of Jews, but of, of Romani and, and of homosexuals and of, of, of just anyone that Hitler deemed undesirable, disabled folks, anybody. They acknowledge that. In this country, you know what we do? There was an article in the, in the paper, I'm from Nashville, there was an article in the paper about six, seven years ago where the Tennessee Department of Workforce Development, they're the folks who do the GED program for high school, they're the ones that design the curriculum. Instead of talking about enslavement and native genocide, they thought they want to teach a class on tolerance. Okay, that sounds good. So they want to teach a class on tolerance, they had to figure out what we're going to put in it, and they thought the whole class was about the Holocaust of European Jewry at the hands of Hitler. Now how is that? We need to teach about the injustice of man to man. I wonder what we might start with. Let's see, let me look out the window of our building here. Oh look, if I look 10 miles that way, there's the Hermitage, that'd be Andrew Jackson's old house. We could start there. No, no, we'll just start with Germany 60 years ago. How about that? We'll do that because that's safer. Now if Germany were to have a class on tolerance and all they did was talk about what we did to native people and, and talked about what we did in this country to people of African descent, we would think that they were crazy. Well, aren't, aren't you forgetting something? That's what we would, y'all are leaving out something, something that y'all did. Why, why don't you have, oh no, we can't talk about that. Because when the crime is ongoing, you don't talk about it. When the crime, or at least functionally speaking, has ended and the residue is being dealt with, then you can deal with it. We aren't dealing with it because the crime is still happening. And I think that's the, the fundamental truth. Um, and so, again, the only way that changes is if we have an honest conversation about that legacy. That legacy of enslavement and native genocide, it isn't just the material consequences. That was bad enough. It's also the psychological consequences because what enslavement does is it plants the seed of a notion of superiority or it plants the seed of a notion of inferiority in the people who live in that society. And so even when the laws change, even when certain customs change, those mentalities can remain. The idea that people of African descent were inferior, the Greeks didn't think that, right? In, in, in ancient days, people of European and Mediterranean descent did not think that. That was a new thing, and that is the outgrowth of the slave system. Slavery created, it wasn't the, there was no mentality of white supremacy first that brought about slavery. Enslavement and genocide of native peoples needed a rationale. They had to come up with a reason to make this okay, and they come up with the notion of white supremacy. So white supremacy is what is born from the system of enslavement and genocide. And that's the thing that, that, that we live with today. So even when the laws change, even when certain areas of, of, of life have, have, we've seen progress, that mentality, to the extent it's still here, we're still living with the issue of that birth. And we have to deal with that legacy. And it's, it's going to require a lot of truth telling. It's going to require white folks acknowledging the damage that that mindset of white supremacy has done to us. And it's going to require people of color dealing with the internalized oppression piece. And, and neither of those are easy, but both of those are necessary. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wise. How you doing? I'm okay. How are you? Um, recently, I heard you on the Mark Thompson show, uh -huh. uh, XM Satellite Radio, and you guys were having a debate on um, whether or not black people can be racist or not. Right, right. I don't think it was a debate. We were discussing it. Yes, right, sir. Right. Explain to me your view on that again, please, sir. Yeah, what I said on Mark's show and what I always say is, um, is this. Racism, first off, in order, to, in order to really address it, you have to remember, racism is two things by definition because it ends with those letters ISM, ism. Anytime you have an ism, it is both an ideology and a system, right? Um, so you think of other examples like capitalism, communism, socialism. Those are philosophies about how to organize an economy or whatever, but they're also systems of organizing it. So it's both a thought and action. And what I say about racism is at the level of thought, at the level of ideology, anybody can be racist regardless of quote unquote race. But at the level of the system, only those with positions of power can be. So it's a little bit different an argument than those who say, well, people of color can never be racist. I mean, you can be up here, 
You can think yourself superior or other people inferior. The point is you can't do much with that. It's like, I can be a capitalist in North Korea, but I ain't going anywhere with that. I can be a communist in a really heavy capitalist country like the United States, but I ain't going anywhere with that because I don't have the power to take my beliefs and turn them into effective action. So the metaphor I use sometimes is a stationary combustion engine. If you think of a stationary combustion engine, it's an engine, right? Think of that as ideological racism. It's there, you know what it is, you can see it when you see it, but only when you add the gasoline, right? Which is the, uh, which is the equivalent of the power of the institutional power, does it actually run? So it's not that the stationary engine's not an engine, and it's not that ideological racism isn't racism, it just doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't do anything. And so I think that's a distinction that I, that I wanna make is that, and, and, that's, and that's, I'm speaking specifically about our country, and I'm speaking specifically about at this time. It's not that at some future place in some other corner of the globe at some future date, a person of color could not wield structural power. And individually, there may be cases where individual people of color with positions of authority wield it in an unfair way that harms a person who happens to be white. But as a matter of systemic truth and institutional daily reality, the two things just aren't remotely comparable. So yes, people of color can quote unquote be racist, but not at the level of actually affecting the life chances or choices or opportunities of white people to any real extent. Yeah. SGA is going to make a presentation. Okay, very good, very good. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brittany Hughes. I'm your 2009 through 2010 homecoming queen. And... Yeah, my name is um, Brian Benjamin Holmes, and I'm your 2009-2010 homecoming king. Hello, my name is Anthony McIntosh, and I'm a senator for the Social Sciences Department here at uh, Philander Smith for the Student Government Association. Could I have uh, Tim Weiss please come up here, please? Um, on behalf of the Philander, uh, Philander Smith student body and the SGA um, student government, we would also we would like to present this plaque in acknowledgement of your advocacy for social justice. Thank you. And uh, it reads, uh, Philander Smith College presents this, fl this flame of appreciation to Tim Weiss, November 10th, 2009. We acknowledge and salute your support and dedication to the struggle for social justice and thank you for sharing, and thanks to you for sharing your knowledge and experience. Right. Give me four minutes. That's all I need. Uh, first, let me have Veronica and Carrie to stand up. They are students on the program tonight. I'm going to ask them at this time if they will escort our speaker so he can prepare for the book signing. So don't y'all run out and start getting your money together because I'm about to ask you to do something about these books in a minute. So if you guys will escort him out while I make a couple of uh, announcements and recognitions. Uh, this is a part of homecoming week for Philander Smith College. Uh, so you saw our homecoming king and queen. Um, any alumni who are still here, please stand up. All right. Thank you. I know at least one of our Board of Trustees members was here. Any Board of Trustees members who are still here? There, no, Freddie Nixon. Freddie Nixon, is at, she's at everything. She's just very progressive. I'm just always excited to see her. We also have with us tonight members of the Racial and Cultural Diversity Commission for the city of Little Rock. They had a meeting on our campus uh, several months ago, and I was uh, telling Erica Benedicto about this coming up and reminding her a couple days ago I wanted them to be here. Uh, so members of the commission, will you please stand? Uh, 
Thank you. Let me acknowledge the chair, uh, Dr. Dennis Burrow, who is no stranger to our campus as well. Also, there are some students, I don't know if they're still here, the pre-law club, political science club at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. They sent me an email last night. Are y'all here? All right. Thank you for being here. It's is Chris at the end here? Who is, okay, I just, Chris sent me an email. See, y'all gotta love it. Students from other institutions can email me as a president, and I sent him an email late last night saying, y'all come on, wasn't that nice? <laughs> all, right, all right, I'll be down there with some students Thursday night. Susan Taylor's speaking at UAPB, so I'll be down there with some students Thursday night. Uh, let me also acknowledge that I know it's here, Judge Alice Gray. Uh, Judge Gray, please stand up, all right, thank you. Also in your program, you can see uh, our series sponsors. We want to thank them for making this series sponsor I, possible. I want to thank all of you who are here and people have been here. I had to wait a couple years before I brought Tim Wise because I didn't know if y'all be ready for this. It was, <laughs> he was going to be real heavy and it took y'all a while to get, you know, because you're sort of listening and if you haven't heard him before and you hear that cadence and the things he's saying, it's sort of like, Whoa. So he's only actually been to speak, he thinks, in Arkansas twice in the last 15 years. And this is probably the first college campus he's done. So I really wanted him to be here. I was just excited. And I'm glad we had a really good turnout tonight. So I want to thank all of you for being here. As soon as we close out, there are copies of, I think, several titles. Please buy books if, if you're trying to figure out how can you really make a difference. Where, where are my students who are still here? Because my students love to read books from the authors who come. Y'all stand up so they can see. I want y'all to see these faces of these students that I have here. They just love when somebody buys a book that they can get signed and they can read it. They just... They love it, so y'all grab one of my, I'm serious, I'm not gonna let y'all out here. Grab one of my students and, and buy them a book because I want them to, to read the book. Let me make one other announcement. Uh, Tim Wise talked a lot about you know, issues with race and the city of Little Rock is very interesting from a historical perspective. And one of the things that we announced today is that physically our campus, the entrance sits on Daisy Bay's Drive. And if you know anything about Daisy Base and the Little Rock Nine, there is this link between Philander and Central High School and the Little Rock Nine that really goes unnoticed. And uh, nine years ago today, 14th Street was changed to Daisy Bates Drive. What we did as announced today as a part of our social justice initiative is that we've changed our address to 900 Daisy Bates Drive in honor of Daisy Bates <laughs> and the social justice movement of the college. Her birthday actually will be tomorrow on uh, November 11th. So you'll see the new address because as more and more people come to campus and they were trying to figure out where exactly we are. So if you say 900 Daisy Bates, it's really easy to find, corner of Daisy Bates and, uh, and Chester Streets. So I wanted to share that with you today. The last speaker for this calendar year, he's been going, he, he had the flu. I think he had the swine flu. Actor Columbus Short from the movie Stomp the Yard, I've been working with his folks, and we had a date, and he got sick, and he couldn't make the second date. So this is our third time trying it, and he had to be healthy because I have all kind of women just want to love on him. So he got to be healthy by the time he comes. Next Wednesday, November 18th, Columbus Short will be here, and then we'll start off next semester.